Folks, we got more Dark Moon Fair cards like this. Uh, pretty crazy legendary for Demon Hunter, a handful more. This is Ilganoth. Uh, scary old godsy dude here for Demon Hunter and a pretty scary card, I think, maybe. Four mana, two six with lifesteal and your lifesteal damages the enemy hero instead of healing you. So taking something defensive and making it hyper aggressive. Demon Hunter likes to go face, they like face damage and uh, I think that makes this card pretty intriguing. So at its base level, just on its own right, it's a two six. What that means is if it attacks the enemy face, it's gonna deal its two base damage. It's gonna try to heal you for two with lifesteal, but because of its effect, it's instead gonna hit the opponent for an additional two, kind of making this a four six when it attacks face. Now, on top of that, if it's just sitting there defensively and your opponent say trades like a couple three threes into it, it's still gonna deal face damage even though they're hitting it with minions because each attack it's gonna try to heal you for two and deal some damage. So if your opponent is using minions at all to clear this, it's probably gonna deliver a little bit of chip damage. In a way, it kind of reminds me of like Wrath Spike Brute in that regard, and that Wrath Spike Brute um, can deal damage to the opponent's face and their minions when attacked, but if it's cleared efficiently, it doesn't do much. Now, Wrath Spike Brute's not an exciting card at all. I don't think Ilganoth at a base level would be either, but of course, he's not the only lifesteal card available to Demon Hunter. Primarily, I think we have to talk about Aldraki Warblades because Aldraki Warblades is a lifesteal card that also scales with weapon damage buffs. We've all seen those scenarios where your opponent plays Aldraki, uh, Twin Slice, Second Slice, Chaos Strike, Hero Power, and they heal for seemingly a billion damage and that helps them stabilize the game in like a Soul Fragment Demon Hunter list. If they do that now with Ilganoth on board, Maybe they don't care about healing you. Maybe they just care about doubling the damage on their Aldraki Warblades. So it's, you know, two at a base. Let's say they add seven via that combination I mentioned. That's nine damage on the Aldraki Warblades being doubled up to 18 with Ilganoth because it's going to try to heal them for nine. And instead, it's going to deal that extra nine to the opponent's face. Now, of course, you have to have Ilganoth on board. So you're spending four mana presumably in those scenarios, but I don't think that's impossible to do. Load up your Aldraki a turn early, Ilganoth and a handful of weapon buffs. You can go completely insane. You could still blade dance to clear the opponent's board. So this seems like a way to pump out tons of damage. Of course, it comes at a little bit of risk if you're not healing as much, maybe the opponent kills you, but as the Demon Hunter player, you'd have that luxury to decide. In some matchups, you might value the lifesteal and you could play towards that. Other scenarios, you need the, the extra damage and Ilganoth provides that uh, opportunity for you. So it seems potentially quite scary. And of course, there are other lifesteal cards as well. Not many that are currently run like Soul Cleaver, Ashtung Battle, Dude, whose name I can't remember exactly. But uh, we also have uh, I-Beam, which is pretty common in Demon Hunter lists, or at least used to be less common today. But I-Beam's a fantastic card. You could even see some scenarios where it's like, man, I'm just gonna use I-beams to deal a ton of face damage. Run um, like a Moarg Artificer, run I-beam, deal six plus damage to the opponent's face. Couple Moargs, you could start scaling it like an OTK combo almost with just <laughs> your I-beams. So uh, there's like three or four different ways to take this card, base level, Aldraki shenanigans, new lifesteal cards on top of things we even know about. I-beam combos like, it seems like it's got a lot of play here, potentially. Is it going to make its way into every Demon Hunter list? No, it has to have the right complements, but could we see that Aldraki Ilganoth weapon package make it into most Demon Hunter lists? I certainly think there's a lot of potential there. All right, so next up here is Ring Toss for Mage, and I feel really bad for this poor turtle man. <laughs> that corrupted artwork is hilarious, but uh, sad a little bit here. This is a four-mana spell. It's uh, going to allow you to discover a secret and cast it. And then if it's corrupted, and just a reminder to corrupt a card, it has to be in hand, and then you play a card of a higher cost. So this has to be chilling in hand. You play it a five mana plus card. It gets corrupted. Once it does, it will then allow you to discover two secrets and cast them. So pretty interesting card here, because at a base level, uh, I definitely don't love the ring toss. It's just like distinctly worse than Arcane Keysmith that we saw in the past, which was a fine card. Not in standard anymore, but totally fine card. 
Uh, that was a 2-2 two -two that allows you to discover a secret. So uh, you got basically the onboard minion upside. That felt like a pretty good stopgap card. In many cases, just kind of play it in the mid game with nothing else to do. Uh, it felt solid. Uh, in this case, without the 2-2, two -two, I don't think ring toss feels nearly as good. A 2-2 two is not much, of course, but it helps trade into a 3-3 three -three ping, etc. Uh, now that said, the corrupted version of ring toss seems pretty strong, right? You're getting six mana in total value. You're getting to discover things that adapt to the game state. So you can pick things that really matter. If you need health, you take that ice barrier. Maybe you think your opponent's going to play something big. You take the mirror entity, etc. So um, I really, really like the corrupted ring toss. That feels like a strong card. Now, the question is, right, does this fit the corrupt game plan? And I have to say, I think this card fits the corrupt game plan much, much better than we've seen in other classes and corrupt cards so far, because I think you could toss this in something like a defensive Highlander Mage and feel pretty good about it. Highlander Mage has a lot of high cost cards. This one's chilling in hand. You maybe don't feel that much pressure to play it on turn four, uh, but by the time you get to turn six, seven, eight, you've got uh, you've gotten it corrupted. You've got some spare mana laying around, not much to do. You play the ring toss and you're pretty happy with the result. And then if you do have Yasharaj in your deck, this is a pretty nuts Yasharaj play as well because you're developing all of this giant board with Yasharaj, presumably, even if it's just Yasharaj himself or whatever other corrupt cards you have. And then you get to discover two secrets and maybe toss in a counter spell to make it really hard for your opponent to deal with that Yasharaj board. So I can definitely see the direction for this card more so when it comes to the corrupt angle and building a deck that supports those different elements that both the Yasharaj kind of pay off and the corrupt setup. So on that note, contextually speaking, I think Ring Toss and Mage makes much more sense than some of the more aggressive or perhaps homeless corrupt cards that didn't really seem to fit as well into an archetype or into their class. So even though this one's pretty weak at a base level, I think it's still playable in a pinch if you just have to get that Ice Barrier you're perhaps okay. And then if you have the time to wait for the corrupt aspect, which I think you often will, that's a pretty good upside. That's quite a bit of stuff to do for four mana with the eventual Yasharaj double payoff down the road as well. All that said, I, I don't really totally understand the flavor of this one. Like what does throwing rings on a turtle have to do with secrets? I, I don't know totally. Maybe the rings are shaped like circles and they're colored like uh, secrets, I guess. Yeah, there are like pink, yellow, green ones. I, I don't totally understand the flavor, but who cares? Uh, I still think it's a pretty nifty little card. All right, next up here, let's talk about some more Demon Hunter cards. And I should note for all the cards in this video, these some of these are like translated and, and this is, you know, like preview art that's a little blurry and stuff. So don't get hung up on that. But uh, this is the renowned performer, new four drop, three, three, rush, death rattle, summon two, one, one assistance with taunt. So you've got here, a little, kind of a awkward clunky minion in a way for your opponent to deal with with all these different aspects. You're trading into something, perhaps value trading. They've got this little death rattle to deal with. They kill that. There's two one ones that pop out. They've got taunt, which can make trades awkward. It can deny damage pretty effectively in the mid game. If they're looking to run some three threes into your face or a big weapon attack or something, they have to deal with these one ones in the meantime, that could cause some hurdles for certain decks to deal with. So I can see some potential as a renowned performer for a way to address early aggressive boards, take that one good trade, maybe get another trade on a future turn, leave behind the taunts. That's a lot to deal with. It's going to be a high friction card for many decks to handle all these different components. There are clearly also some token demon hunter game plans here where you've just got three minions bundled into one. If you care about token synergies, bodies on board, uh, this could play really nicely to that. Now, that said, this is a little bit of a different direction than other token Demon Hunter cards we've seen where only one aspect of this has Rush, the others are kind of sitting behind. It could be tough to use if you're trying to kill minions off specifically in a given moment as opposed to uh, delaying that token aspect. So uh, may not fit in with all the other like Illidari Rush cards because those are like, I want to kill everything at once, then I want to play some card draw, Beast of Souls, or whatever it's called on top of that. This card doesn't work as well into that game plan. So although clearly some token synergies here, I almost see this as more of like a generalized defensive card you'd run in a deck that's just trying to maintain uh, some early to mid game survivability. I don't know if this would be a token card so much as like maybe a Highlander Demon Hunter with a slightly slower curve or a control deck, keeping aggro uh, starts in board. Those sorts of things seem like a better fit for a renowned performer. All that said, despite all these you know different angles, I don't know if there's just enough output in this card. Like it feels fine, but it doesn't feel really strong which you know good outstanding hearthstone cards today they get played usually feel kind of a little bit broken 
this almost feels a bit fair in a way. So I, I think a totally fine card. I could see it popping into that Highlander list. I do not think most Demon Hunters, as they are currently seen, are making room for this one right now, uh, but a completely acceptable card otherwise. So next up here is Expendable Performers. Again, maybe not a final name there, I'm not sure, but it's a seven mana spell for Demon Hunter. It summons you seven, one, one Illidari with Rush. So much like our previous uh, Illidari summoning cards, Command the Illidari, I don't remember all their names, uh, but this one has a special condition. If they all die this turn, you summon seven more. Presumably that seven more is happening immediately. Uh, not like at the end of turn, for instance. So if you can trade all of them in, this is something like a 14 damage board clear that is very easily spread across multiple minions in most cases. So, um, it, you know, it could also be like a 10 damage board clear that leaves behind four one ones in that sort of uh, Reno the Relicologist style, creating a board swing of sorts. You've also got anything, of course, playing off of token synergies that could go completely bonkers with this, like Wrath Scale Naga, I guess could be a billion extra damage. It might be hard because uh, often the Rascal would kill off the minions you need to trade into, but if your opponent has a big enough board, sure, maybe you could get 14 ticks on your Rascal Naga after trading in one Illidari, playing the Rascal, and then, or maybe I should say 13 ticks because you got to trade in that first one. Uh, that's, you know, what, uh, 39 damage to the opponent's face or board if things go perfect. I think that's a pretty unlikely scenario. That's like a weird 10-mana combo that I don't think we're going to see often. But um, just regular token synergy cards, right? Like Feast of Souls or Cult Master to draw a handful of cards. You probably don't want to draw 14 or 13, whatever it is. But you get the idea. There's a lot of ways to play off of this one. So, you know, it's this weirdly flexible removal tool that's kind of nifty. We've seen it work in Quest Hunter with the uh, Locust Swarm. We've seen it in Demon Hunter not perform so far. My question is, is it just too expensive? Like Quest Hunter, it works because you have the hero power to really help the Locusts um, thrive. Like both getting to the hero power is nice, but also once that hero power is done, you're bumping them all to three attack. Um, that makes way more sense in, in Hunter. Like it can make big swings much, much more uh, reasonably because of those attack boosts. Demon Hunter doesn't have quite as many ways to play into these getting a higher attack value, so it might be harder to use them as effectively and as efficiently. Plus, it's just a turn later at turn seven instead of turn six. So, you know, we haven't seen Token Demon Hunter really come together yet. I, I feel like this is actually, despite having like twice the output of the uh, efficiency of these other token demon hunter Illidari summoners because you're basically getting two for one on this one. I still feel like it's just a little bit too slow perhaps to make sense. That said, you know, clearly if a Highlander demon hunter pops up, this could be a great mid game card to swing things. So it's another one of those cards. I certainly see some play for it here and there. It doesn't necessarily fit the archetypes we understand for demon hunter today, but because it has that crazy upside and a lot of output for the card, this is still, I think one to keep an eye on. All right, next up here is Hammer of the Naru for Paladin. I love Draenei Paladin stuff, so I'm all about this card. It's a six mana, three, three, Battle Cry Summon, a six, six, Holy Elemental with Taunt. So uh, you're getting a pretty nice defensive body there, nice six, six Taunt, and a three, three weapon to go with it. I mean, a three, three weapon by turn six isn't really all that exciting, I'd say. It might allow you to chip off some minions here and there, run a little bit of damage to face. I think mostly it's the 6-6 six, six you care about here. And this makes it kind of like a better uh, fire elemental for Shaman because you're going to be able to deal three immediately, get a reasonably sized body on board. But the body's better, it's got taunt, and the weapon's better than the three damage most of the time because you're getting you know three ticks of it. You might not like taking face damage if you're attacking into a minion, so there's some downsides. But generally speaking, this is a much higher strength card than fire elemental, which... Isn't a great card these days, but it's probably an acceptable card. It's, you know, uh, for, a, for a classic or basic card in particular, it holds up pretty darn well, I'd say, over the last six years. So, of course, you could envision worlds where um, a Paladin deck that cares about big threats, uh, big defensive plays, runs Hammer of the Naru. If they have a lot of healing, they're able to use this weapon to take trades without risking too much life. That's great news. You could see things like uh, big dual paladins where you need cards that um, summon you minions without running minions because you only want to run really big stuff in your deck. That's great. But uh, all of those are options. But I think the real reason this card exists and the most exciting and interesting is Nazoth, our new 
old god that summons you minions from different types. Uh, here we get an elemental for paladin, which otherwise might be difficult to do. There's always Siamot, which is a 6-6 six, six elemental, but he'd be a naked 6-6 six, six elemental. With Hammer of the Naru, you're going to put a 6-6 six, six taunt elemental into your pool, which is great off of Nazoth, because when you play a card like Nazoth, it's always, you want to make sure that you have enough defensive utility there that you don't just die the turn you play Nazoth. That was easy in the old days with cards like Sludge Belcher. Uh, now, if you're running Nazoth for the different minion types, you get an elemental, a 6-6 six, six elemental with taunt. That might be enough to help you stabilize that Nazoth turn. And then, of course, you're running whatever other big crazy stuff you want in Paladin to, uh, to make the Nazoth worth it. But I like this as the Menagerie support card for Paladin. Maybe Paladin's going to be the Menagerie class. They've clearly already got some Murlocs. Maybe we don't have a great beast at the moment, but perhaps that gets solved as well. So, you know, I, there's a couple different interesting angles for this card. That said, my instincts still tell me it's actually a little bit slow. 6-6 uh, six, six taunts, awesome, but it's not that good in the scheme of Hearthstone these days, right? But you get By the time you get 6-7 mana, people are doing just completely broken, insane things. Often a 6-6 six, six taunt's just not going to keep up. And the 3-3 three, three weapon isn't really going to help much in that regard either. So, you know, compared to like Librem Paladin, for instance, I think, you know, if you're talking about 6 mana these days, uh, you're often already on your Librem of Hope, and you're summoning an 8-8 Divine Shield taunt, and you're healing a ton to stabilize. Does Hammer of the Naru keep up in that world with Paladin? I mean, maybe it's complimentary, maybe it's extra on top, but it doesn't feel as fast. So... This is another card that, you know, I think it has some potential. There's a, a line here or there for this one to take, but I don't think this is going to overwhelm anybody as a high-powered card. I don't think this becomes a staple for the class. It's merely an acceptable option with some potential given that Menagerie line. So next up here is the prize looter for Rogue. Again, probably not a final name. The artwork a little blurry. It's a one-mana 2-1 one combo deal. One damage to a minion for each other card you've played this turn. So we got here a nice little uh, low-cost board swing style card that scales with cards played, much like Edwin in the past. But instead of developing a threat, this is going to help you react to your opponent's threats. I think, generally speaking, this is dealing something like two to four damage. Anything more than that's going to be tough in a lot of turns. Of course, Rogue can go for those crazy, you know, six, seven, eight card turns. But uh, how often is that going to line up well with Prize Looter? I think rarely, and Rogue has great removal tools for that sort of stuff. Anyway, if you need to kill an 8-8, maybe the sap is just better than trying to force a prize looter. But I think it thrives in that like two to four damage range where it's just killing that opponent's 3-3 and developing a little bit on board. And with shadow steps and backstabs and all these other various things, I think prize looter will add up to be a significant way to flip boards. That said, right now, I think it's really competing against things like lackeys. You know, maybe a cobalt lackeys just more efficient to help you open up combos because you're going to want to end your turn with a prize looter, which does reduce a little bit of the flexibility of the one mana card, whereas often you like those cheap one mana cards to activate other combo stuff. So that's a little bit wonky. That said, still very efficient at one mana as well. So maybe not the end of the world. And of course, lackeys are going to rotate fairly soon. So maybe prize looter fills in that slot as one of those really flexible cards that helps you react to your opponent's early boards, but you could envision scenarios where this is conditional and you just don't really have the cards in hand to load this thing up to get it to that three damage necessary, and then it feels clunky as opposed to um, really, really efficient. So, you know, it's hard to say. I think in a world with like Secret Passage and really cheap rogue cards, this probably gets there, but I also have some hesitations about it because I think it could be clunky. It could get stuck from time to time. And it doesn't feel quite as efficient as a lot of the ways Rogue is already removing minions in the early game, of which they have a lot of ways to react to stuff. So um, is it better than SI7 Agent? Is it better than Backstab? Those classics we've known forever. Does it really increment on those? Maybe only a little, which leaves me concerned. But that said, it still seems like a card that's very efficient for what it does, makes big swings. So I'm sure Rogue will find some way to make a card like this work. Ilganoth is a five-star card. Ring Toss is a four-star card. Renowned Performer is a three-star card. Expendable Performers is a three-star card. Hammer of the Naru is a three-star card. Prize Looter is a four-star card. And there you go, folks. That wraps it up for uh, review number three, I think. I don't know. Uh, pretty cool cards, though. I really like uh, big characters like Ilganoth. Some pretty crazy designs. Otherwise... Uh, curious to hear your thoughts on these. Do you think the 
Uh, I beam OTK is there with Ilganoth. You think it's just a general card, general use card? Uh, do you like Aldraki? Tell me your thoughts. Is it good? Is it bad? I want to hear it all. That said, also stay tuned later today for my own card reveal. Pretty interesting card. Nothing crazy, but I think uh, at least something to talk about with that one should be a lot of fun. Uh, so all that said, thanks as always for watching. More reveals, more reviews, all that on the way. Subscribe if you want to see that stuff. My God, it's the best deal in town. It's free and you get to see this beautiful face every day. That said, uh, thanks as always for watching and until next time, game on.